Hello, and good to see you all again as we start part three here of our Easter sermon series. I pray you are all doing well. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you haven't watched part one and part two of this series, uh, to check out our channel on YouTube there and, and watch those two first. You know, we, we began in part one back with the disciples deserting Jesus and just kind of that whole process they went through and Jesus went through as he's coming to the cross. So I encourage you to check those out first. Uh, today we're going to be in, in Mark chapter 15 as we specifically look at uh, the crucifixion uh, and what that time was like. You know, we've seen thus far, Mark, uh, Mark isn't a guy who really got into to long ex explaining narratives. He kind of hits the facts and hits the details and gives us the most important things that we need to know. And that's what we find here, too, in the details that he includes about uh, the crucifixion. So we're going to begin here uh, reading verses 16 uh, through 32. Uh, so here we go, Mark 16. Or excuse me, Mark 15, verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head, with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others. They said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Let's thank God for his word and pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, uh, that you were so willing to give your life for us, that you were willing to endure the cross to bring glory to your Father and to bring redemption and salvation for our sake. Lord, I pray that as we reflect on the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord, that we would recognize that your crucifixion was no ordinary death, Lord, that we would recognize your commitment to honoring your Father and the incredible love and grace that you have shown us. May we leave this time and may we walk away from this passage humbled and encouraged in our faith, that we would recognize that you are worth living for in every way because you were willing to die for us. Thank you, Jesus. It is in your name we pray. Amen. When Mark says here that Jesus was led there into the palace or the praetorium, uh, that means he was actually taken into Pilate's personal courtyard. You remember, Pilate had basically condemned him to death at this point after the mobs and the crowds had been shouting, crucify him, crucify him. 
General Pilate was not normally stationed in Jerusalem, but a coastal town called Caesarea. Uh, he was probably only in Jerusalem to oversee the Passover and everything connected with it. And so there in this, this palace, this praetorium that was set up there for him uh, in the city, he brought Jesus into that court in his own home there uh, to experience the beating and the flogging. And scripture says that all of Pilate's men, the entire company that he had with him of soldiers, came and participated in what took place. The soldiers mocked and abused Jesus, torturing him like the way a cat might play with a wounded and helpless mouse. They took a purple robe, a symbol of authority and royalty, and they threw it across his bleeding back. Then they took thorns and wove them together in the shape of a crown. They pressed that crown upon his scalp, no doubt puncturing his head and causing further bleeding. You know, they mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And the soldiers continued to beat Jesus by using a staff, striking him on the head over and over again, no doubt driving that crown of thorns even further into his head. The soldiers spit on him, and they fell on their knees to dramatically bombard him with further scorn and sadistic ridicule. You know, it was prophesied throughout the Psalms and again later in Isaiah chapter 53 that the, that the Messiah would be severely mocked and scorned just as Jesus was here. Yet many have wondered, why would these seemingly random soldiers even care to invest such energy in mocking a man that, well, they had probably never met and probably knew very little about? I mean, what did they possibly have to gain from these cruel acts against Jesus. The various sources suggest that this may have actually been common practice for Roman soldiers, especially when they were dealing with foreign or conquered leaders that were set to be executed. It's as if, since Jesus claimed to be the king of the Jews, that these soldiers are treating him the same way that they would have treated a ruler or a general or a king that their group had personally defeated in battle. It's as if they were gloating over some sort of victory. But the reality is there was no victory for them in these circumstances. And in the performance of this ritual cruelty against the Son of God, their wickedness and evil that was deeply embedded in their hearts was simply only revealed for what it truly was. There was just no reason for this. It was just pure evil all of this just further testifies to the sinful nature of man and how sin just warps our nature and can lead us to do horrible and wicked things. It also reminds us of why Jesus needed to die for us. You know, but eventually and finally, their mocking and abuse had run its course and they rip that purple robe off of Jesus' back, another painful act that would have ripped all those scabs right off with it, reopening the wounds caused by their initial flogging and beating of Jesus. There is no question that this entire experience must have been physically and emotionally excruciating for Jesus. You know, in John's Gospel, in John chapter 19, uh, John added that Pilate attempted here actually to make one last appeal to the Jewish mob led by the high priest bringing the beaten and bloody Jesus out before them. Maybe he hoped that seeing Jesus in this a beaten and bloody state might appease their hatred towards them. But the mob showed no compassion to Jesus, and thus Pilate had Jesus led away to be crucified. Now it was standard Roman practice to force their crucifixion victims to actually carry their own cross, or at the very least, the cross beam on their cross, to the place of their own execution. It was just another way to humiliate them and as a warning sign to others not to question Roman authority. But Jesus was so weak from the abuse he had already received that he was physically unable to carry his own cross. Scripture says here that the Romans essentially grabbed a man from random from the crowd, 
a man named Simon from, Cy from Cyrene, uh, who probably had simply come into Jerusalem for the Passover uh, celebration and to do his part of the worship rituals that, that day. He probably had heard of Jesus, but that doesn't mean he really had any idea what was going on or even why Jesus was being crucified. You know, some may argue that this man Simon was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But the fact that he, as well as his sons, are named here actually might suggest otherwise. You know, there really wasn't much reason for Mark to mention his name, let alone the names of his sons, unless these men were all known by those early Christians who were first reading this letter from Mark. Many have wondered if Simon and his family indeed ultimately became Christians, possibly even partly due to this circumstance here where Simon carried Jesus' cross. You know, in the moment, I'm sure it was simply terrifying for Simon to be caught up in all of this. But if it ultimately played a part in his, in his family's eventual salvation, then I imagine looking back, he would have said, well, it was worth it and possibly the most important experience of his life. Nonetheless, this would have been a decently long, intimidating, and draining walk for both Simon and Jesus. It was generally the custom for Romans to hold their executions just outside of major cities, often near where key roads would enter into the city gates. Thus, all the travelers who were coming and going from the city would be able to see the executions. The place of Jesus' death here is called Golgotha, which in Aramaic means the place of the skull, a name that was probably meant to be intimidating considering the place's, well, use and political purpose. Now, verse 23 here records an interesting detail, explaining that Jesus was actually offered a drink mixture of wine and myrrh. This may have been the only semi-nice or kind act that the Roman soldiers offered in any way to Jesus throughout this entire ordeal. Uh, the mixture of wine and myrrh uh, was in essence uh, an ancient narcotic of sorts, meant to dull the pain and the experience a bit uh, for the one being crucified. Notice here, though, that Jesus refuses to take this drink to numb the pain of his experience, but instead... Jesus chooses to experience all of the terrible sufferings that come with crucifixion. You know, Mark really doesn't go into the detail of the nature of crucifixion here. It was a rather gruesome and graphic form of death that I'm sure his original Roman readers understood quite well and were familiar with. You know, sometimes the victims of crucifixion could hang on the cross for multiple days um, before they would finally die. And death uh, would be caused eventually by suffocation due to complete and utter exhaustion. Because the body would eventually no longer have the strength to continue to push itself up on those nails upon which it, on which it hung, thus preventing the lungs from opening up enough to get air. Crucifixion with all of its pain and all of its piercings and bloodiness, it was actually suffocation and exhaustion that would result in death. But Mark doesn't go into any of this. Instead, he just he rifles off these details about what was going on around Jesus as he died. He mentions that the soldiers cast lots, which lots were basically an ancient form of dice, and they did so to decide who would get to keep Jesus' clothes, since, well, it didn't seem that he would be needing them any longer. This was an action that was actually a fulfillment of prophecy about the Messiah, recorded in Psalm 22, verse 18. It was also standard practice for a criminal's crimes to be posted at his place of death. But if you remember, you know, there was no formal or official charge that Jesus was guilty of. And so it seems Pilate, instead of listing a charge, chose to list Jesus' personal claim about himself, that he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate had this posted above his head. 
You know, this sign would have been intended to mock the chief priest who had brought Jesus to Pilate just as much as it was you know, presented mockingly about Jesus. Remember, it was the chief priest's jealousy uh, of Jesus' popularity and influence that had really led to this entire scenario. At least that was the case from Pilate's perspective. And so this may have been Pilate's way of mocking the pettiness of the Jewish religious leaders. Mark continues here to explain that in further fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53, that Jesus was counted among the lawless ones, that he was crucified between two criminals. Mark also describes how those passing by mocked Jesus. Now, and this is interesting, that all these people coming and going from Jerusalem would take the time to stop and mock Jesus. No doubt they had heard of Jesus. Many of them may have even seen Jesus teach or perform miracles. If they were from Galilee, they certainly probably had seen Jesus do such things. And yet, since from their perspective, since Jesus was unable to save himself from this predicament, it seemed it didn't matter to them all that Jesus had done, the things he had said and taught, the miracles he had performed, the number of people that he had healed. You know... Like we discussed yesterday, Jesus' claims about himself are really central in all of this. Not only was his claim posted above his head, you know, Jesus, the king of the Jews, but also it's the reason why the people were mocking Jesus. You know, people don't normally mock someone because they were helping others or healing others, but people do have a tendency to mock those who appear to make large boast about themselves and then aren't able to follow through with their boast. And maybe the people had decided that certainly Jesus had done some incredible things that they didn't understand and maybe even some things they appreciated. But ultimately, they believed that Jesus wasn't the power or authority or person he claimed to be. The religious leaders obviously felt this way about Jesus and they certainly had quite the influence on the crowd that day. You know, they had rejected Jesus' personal claims. They had publicly attacked and ridiculed him. And now here, as Jesus appeared to be in a completely vulnerable and helpless state, it probably appeared to everyone that Jesus could not live up to those self-proclamations and claims, that Jesus couldn't possibly be who he said he was if here he was hanging upon a cross. Yet there's a lot of irony in this, as the chief priests there were mocking Jesus, saying he saved others, but he can't save himself. You know, this, these statements here were meant to be sarcastic and cruel. But the reality is that Jesus did and was saving others. You know, if Jesus had so desired, he could have saved himself from the cross. He could have avoided the cross. He could have come down off the cross. The church praised the Lord that he did it. Praise the Lord that he stayed on the cross. Jesus could have come down. He had full authority over all things. Nothing was and is too hard for him. He could have put an end to all this in an instant. You see, in the chief priest mocking him here, he actually also reveals an important truth for us. Since Jesus chose not to save himself from the cross and instead chose to submit himself to his Father's will, Jesus was able to save us. For as the prophet Isaiah foretold, by his wounds we are healed. The religious leaders taunted Jesus, suggesting that if Jesus came down off the cross, maybe then they would believe him. But the truth is that it was because he chose to stay upon the cross that the reality of who he is and why he had come was verified and completed. Those nails did not keep him there. His submission to his Father and his love for us kept Jesus on the cross until the moment that his sacrifice was complete. Now let's keep reading here in verse 33. 
as we see as how Jesus' sacrifice was ultimately completed. Verse 33. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, so as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. Mark just simply continues here to hit the highlights of the events surrounding Jesus' final moments and then his burial. You know, while Jesus hung on the cross, not only Mark, but the other Gospels tell us that it was dark for at least three hours. It was as if the entire world recognized what was taking place. But it was at this point here, at the conclusion of that time, that Jesus cried out in Aramaic, which was the common language of the people and would have been understood by all the Jews and travelers gathered there. As he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now these interesting and important words, well, their exact meaning and implications have been debated by great links uh, by many people over the years. You know, this was certainly an excruciating and emotionally charged cry. What does it mean that God had forsaken him? You know, recognize that as Jesus hung upon that cross, that he was receiving the full wrath of God against the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future. Now the exact semantics of how that expression of wrath being poured upon him exactly impacted the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, well, I'll, I admit that's, that's kind of beyond my ability to fully comprehend that. But one thing is clear, and that, that is that this... This expression of wrath, it was the only time that the Father related to the Son in this way. The only point in their eternal and infinite and perfect relationship that there was a moment where the Father would have poured wrath out against the Son. I mean, think about it. They had been in perfect unity in every way. Their relationship wasn't defined by anger or brokenness or any division, but by blessing by righteousness, by truth, by holiness, by complete and perfect and infinite love. You know, the Trinity is in and of itself another thing beyond my comprehension for exactly the same reasons why this whole scenario and what Jesus meant by this is hard to understand. But what we do know is that this was the only time where the Father poured out his wrath against and upon his Son. Because of our sin, that was laid on him. 
So regardless of the semantics or the details, Jesus, in bearing this wrath from his Father, he cried out in agony as he experienced his relationship with him in a whole new and different way. You know, the horror of personally being on the receiving end of his Father's wrath instead of his Father's blessing must have been an incredible weight in and of itself, not to mention the weight of bearing all of our sin. Yet even as Jesus was experiencing all of this, he did not reject his father, his Father's will or his Father's name or his Father's glory. But once again, he continued to remain on the cross and to endure all of this for the sake of his Father's name and for the sake of our salvation. The crowd standing there watching Jesus die didn't understand any of this, or even what exactly Jesus may have said or why he said it. You know, Scripture notes here that they quickly got something to wet his mouth, something they put on a stick up there so he had something to drink. It seems that they were hoping that maybe Jesus had more to say, and that if they wet his mouth, then maybe he'd cry out for Elijah or do something else interesting or dramatic. It doesn't seem they were really concerned for Jesus or wanted to give him something to drink so much as, well, they were hoping the show might continue. It was just another moment of them mocking Jesus. But instead here what we find is that Jesus let out one final cry and then took his last breath. You know, this matter of, of dying in, in and of itself is fascinating because it implies that Jesus did not die of suffocation because of a complete lack of energy and due to exhaustion. You know, typical victims of crucifixion wouldn't have possessed the strength to cry out in any manner when it came to the time of their death. They would have been too tired and their body wouldn't have had the strength. But you see, Jesus' final cry here, it wasn't a cry of agony. It wasn't a final cry of the pains of death. It was a cry of triumph, a shout of victory. Jesus had obeyed his Father's will. He had endured the cross. He had laid down his life as a sacrifice for us. He had faced the full wrath of God against all sin. And now, like a runner crossing the finish line after a grueling and painful endurance race, he shouted out in victory and surrendered his life for you and for me. And it's at this point that Mark makes note of two final important events that occurred at the moment of Jesus' death. First, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. And secondly, the centurion who was overseeing this crucifixion professed his own faith in the fact that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. The curtain mentioned there was the curtain that separated the most holy place, the holy of holies in the temple, where the Ark of the Covenant set and where the high priest was allowed to enter only once a year. It was there that there was this very large, thick curtain that kept people out from this sacred place. It was a clear and visible dividing wall that demonstrated that there was separation between God and man due to our sin. And the way that this curtain tore from top to bottom was extremely uh, unnatural and really unexplainable except for the fact that it made it clear that God himself was the one who tore this curtain open. You know, likewise, it was God who had just made atonement for us. It was God himself who had sacrificially given himself for us at the cross. It was he who had destroyed the barrier between us and him. It was he who had addressed our sin that separated us. The tearing of the curtain in the temple there was a declaration that the old covenant upon which the temple and the Ark of the Covenant rested was no longer in effect. But now, due to the sacrifice of Christ, all men would relate to God 
on the basis of this new covenant of the blood of Jesus. Furthermore, this centurion, who had no doubt overseen multiple crucifixions throughout his career as a Roman soldier and commander, he had never seen a crucifixion quite like this one. You know, he certainly would have recognized the unique nature and the strangeness of the way Jesus died and all the unique signs that accompanied it. And after he witnessed all of this, it was enough for him to confirm that Jesus indeed must have been and was the Son of God. Jesus' death was certainly no ordinary death to all those who witnessed it, which this was Mark's final point and goal in this chapter, to mention all those who witnessed Jesus' death and who took care of his body and thus also witnessed his final resting place, that is, his final resting place before his resurrection. And thus, he is giving, in essence, a list of those who could give testimony to the truthfulness of this account, but also assurance that Christ had indeed died that day. Because remember, they had to prove that he had died to thus also demonstrate that he had risen from the dead. And Mark mentions the many women who had loved Jesus, who had supported him and followed him throughout his ministry, and how they had gathered there that day to observe from a distance Jesus' time upon the cross. Mark also explains that once Jesus died, this, this man who seemingly comes out of nowhere, not mentioned anywhere else before this, Joseph from Arimathea, he comes and goes to Pilate, and takes a great personal risk, laying his public reputation on the line and identifying himself with Jesus by requesting Jesus' body in order that he might give Jesus a proper and honorable burial. It seems that this Joseph was a secret follower and disciple of Jesus. He may not have been following Jesus around from place to place, but he had heard Jesus preach. He had heard Jesus' claims about himself, and he believed. And now after this, Joseph took it upon himself to ensure that Jesus was honored in the best way Joseph knew how to do that. You know, rarely was a crucifixion victim given any sort of proper burial. In fact, normally victims of crucifixion after they died could hang upon a cross for weeks as their bodies would rot and be eaten by bugs and birds. It just added to the gruesome effect and the demonstration to society not to question Roman rule. But yet here, Joseph, he takes great care to quickly get Jesus' body as soon as possible so that nothing else would happen to it. And he buys expensive linen cloth, and he wraps Jesus' body in it. And he gives Jesus this really an expensive burial, placing him in a tomb cut out of a rock, not in a hole in the ground, but a tomb cut out of a rock was the sort of tomb that only the wealthy could afford and purchase. Jesus was truly given a premium resting place, so to speak. Mark made it clear, Jesus died for us. And his death was no ordinary death. And his death and his burial could be confirmed by a great many people who personally saw it. You know, not only was Jesus' death a unique death, but it also had a unique purpose. Jesus gave up his life for us. His life wasn't taken from him. It wasn't the Jews who killed Jesus. It wasn't the Romans who killed Jesus. They had no power or authority over Jesus. Jesus willingly went to the cross to honor his heavenly Father and to save our souls. You know, it's the cross and Jesus' death, it's, it's a symbol, it's a picture, it's a story that as believers we talk about often. Uh, the, there aren't many sermons that I've delivered where I haven't at least mentioned the cross or Jesus' death. It's a common point of discussion for us as Christians. And it's also a foundational part of our belief. But rarely, I think, do we take the time to reflect on just how significant it is and just how incredible it is 
that our God chose to die in this way for us. That he chose this as the means to demonstrate his incredible love for us. To save us, to give us life, eternal life. That the Son of God would go through all of this. That God himself, the whole triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, would choose this experience, this painful and excruciating means to save our souls, to bring us redemption, and to bring glory and honor to the Father by showing His incredible grace. You know, I pray today uh, that all of you watching this know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that you know that Jesus died for you, and that you can come to know Him as Savior and Lord, that you can be saved, That because of his blood spilt for you on the cross that day, your sins can be washed away. Not because of anything you've done. Not because any of us are worthy of such an incredible and infinitely costly gift. But simply because of our Lord's love for us. I pray that you would humble yourself and submit yourself to him. Saying yes to him. Trusting him to save you and forgive you of your sin for those of you who are watching this who are believers i pray that you would continue to honor christ that you would remember the significance of his sacrifice that what he has done for us would be the defining factor of how each of us lives our lives day in and day out remembering the example he set for us in obedience to his father's will and remembering the demonstration of love and grace that he gave to us at such a great cost, and the reminder that showing such love and grace to others for the sake of the Father's will is likewise worth the cost. What an awesome God we serve. Praise the Lord. He remained on the cross for us. Let's pray. Lord, I just pray once more that we would choose to trust you as Savior and Lord, that we would place our hope in you, that we would not trust in ourselves or our own abilities, that we would recognize who you are and what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you have shown us. Thank you for staying on the cross. Thank you for enduring the cross and the wrath of the Father against sin. What an amazing God you are. What an incredible Savior you are. Lord, we eagerly await the moment when we will see you face to face. When we will honor you and praise you in person. May we continue to walk by faith this day. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. It's good to spend more time with you. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow as we look at and reflect on our Lord's resurrection three days later after this crucifixion. See you soon.